Titan Developer Conference to Devlin. So, uh, how's everybody feeling? Did you have a good week? Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear you all say that because really, you know, I've been to every Tizen event that we've had since we started this. And this is hands down the best that I've been to. In terms of the people who are here, the sessions that are being presented, the sponsors that we've got, I, this has just been the best so far. And never have I run more as early in the morning, slept less, or uh, smashed so many pairs of glasses. I got so excited today, I crushed my glasses and some miracle around my face. Uh, anyway, this is the Dev Lab, and we're going to go through a couple of things today. The goal is to introduce you to the native API, introduce you to the web API, then take you through uh, you know, how to actually create some code and get it deployed uh, on a Tizen device. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, this is actually a two-part session. We're going to start off in here, and take a short break, and then move to a hackathon, which is happening in the hacker lounge. You can find that uh, downstairs, you can follow the signs out of the lobby. Before we get started, though, I'd like to give you a few more details on the Times and Apps Challenge. Now, you've all heard that this was announced during the keynote, TSG keynote, uh, a few days ago, and I wanted to give you some specifics on it, what you can win, how to do it, when it's open, and those sorts of things. So what you can win, this is the, the most important part. Uh, you can see we've got some pretty impressive prizes here. Uh, if you're developing a game, Grand prize, it went up to $200,000. Uh, if you're developing in, in one of the non gaming categories, up to $120,000. And for the top 10 HTML5 applications, there's an additional $50,000 available. So we really, you know, we want to see some great apps coming into the Tizen store. We want to see some great apps submitted to this contest. And we really want to see some HTML5. So, uh, you know, again, this is, uh, this is the, the contest. So, how do you enter? This is another big question. It's actually a two-stage process. Stage one, submit your app to the Tizen store. Uh, Seller.tizenstore.com is where you go for that. Stage two is to actually enter the Tizen app challenge. And any apps that have submitted, been submitted to the Tizen store since it opened, really, you know, just recently, uh, and through the end of the contest period, uh, can be eligible for the Tizen app challenge. So even if you submit before the app challenge begins on uh, June 3rd. There's a lot more info ties in app challenge. Now, I did mention it does open up June 3rd, but there is a form on there right now. Please go, please register. Uh, let us know the sorts of things that you're interested in developing and submitting. And we'll keep you posted to make sure you don't miss any of the, you know, any of the dates that are coming up. And we'll make sure you know about additional uh, hackathons, portathons, and other events like that. So with that, again, Tizen App Challenge, the best thing to do would be take what you create today, get that into the Tizen store, and when things open up on June 3rd, get it into the, get it into the challenge. So with that, uh, I don't want to stand up here for too long, so I'd like to introduce Todd, who's going to come and talk a little bit about uh, some of the time APIs, and he is going to be using the first session. Here we go. All righty. So my name is Todd Greeley. I am a technical evangelist with Samsung. And today I'm going to run through, and this is going to go kind of quick, because I want to actually go through these slides and get us into the actual code session. So I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, as mentioned, I'm going to talk and give you a quick overview of the native development environment and actually show the beginnings of creating a typical app. And so we'll actually walk you through how to build a simple application to get you started with this. So first of all, Tizen SDK overview. Uh, how many people, I don't know, saw it on like sessions on this already? Are there people that aren't familiar with uh, Eclipse? I'm going to assume, I think everyone here is, is pretty mature developer and mobile probably to some extent. But I do want to kind of uh, run through quickly, just so you can follow along with the, the coding session in a minute here. 
So, Titan was built with the SDK, uh, comes with an IDE, almost certainly recognize this if you've, uh, certainly if you've worked with Android or lots of other development environments, uh, you'll recognize a sort of typical Eclipse layout here. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to point out that are unique to dive in here. One, we have the Connection Explorer. So this is where you're going to be able to see when you're hooked up a device. You can actually go through and look at the file system. Uh, I get kind of a kick out of the fact that if you're used to Linux file systems, it'll be blindingly obvious immediately that this is a Linux platform underneath. And uh, a couple other extras that we have are uh, the event injector. So this is really a nice extra kind of tool that you don't have in some of the other platforms where you can actually simulate all sorts of events, and I won't go into the whole breadth of them, but you have things, you know, from typical stuff that you'd expect all the way through, you know, uh, NFC and a bunch of other things supporting it. And there's also a little code snippet uh, bit. So that just helps facilitate just a few standard things, uh, particularly around doing exception handling, uh, logging and some simple stuff like that that makes life easy to cut in there. So, not surprisingly, of course, I think uh, this comes with a, a device emulator. Uh, so I had shown you the Connection Explorer and earlier, and this is just kind of a blown up view of that to show you a little bit of what that looks like. And in particular, what I wanted to highlight is how you actually get to the emulator manager. So I'm trying to get into sort of practical bits and pieces here of how you actually use this. So, you know, certain things can feel a little bit hidden. So this is where you're going to go. So you bring up the emulator manager. And the emulator manager is, of course, where you're going to set up your virtual devices to use for your testing. And it's really straightforward here. Uh, you can just go in, you know, create a new emulator. There's a, a few parameters that you want to set as things like memory size, the actual display density, uh, things that, of course, you expect in something where you're supporting, you know, different size devices. In terms of uh, Project Explorer, these are just to show kind of the layout of some of the things that you'd expect to see when you create a project. So you can see, as you'd expect, the uh, source and header files are in their own subdirectors. So the source, you know, the actual CPP files and one and the uh, header files in this uh, include directory. Um, there's some other things that's important, this binary segment. The reason I like to point this one out is because this will tell you whether your compilation work or not. If you don't have your binaries directory, it gets populated after you build your app and something's going wrong. Uh, resources, typical thing where you're going to have uh, images, audio. It's also where you're going to have your UI layout files. And this, the UI layouts are uh, XML files. Again, if you're used to Android, you'll be familiar with, with that style of the declarative layout. Uh, libraries. So you can actually have, uh, and again, its underlying system is actually Linux, so the ability to have uh, actually shared object libraries uh, can be useful. Your data directory, so this is basically something that's where your application is, is the portion of the file system is kind of set aside for your application to say something is persistent data. And actually, inside of there, um, you can find an area with, uh, actually it's not inside there, but uh, another key one to point out is a shared area where you can actually have data that's shared and accessible between applications. Okay, so that was a really, really zippy bit just to show you some of the highlights. And um, kind of continuing on, uh, I just wanted to show this to kind of highlight the UI paradigm so that you can kind of follow along with what I'm doing. And the main thing that I want to get across here is that the, the
basic structure of, of a typical UI. So one of the cool things about Tizen is it's built in a way that, that supports a lot of these sort of standard paradigms for mobile in a way that makes it really easy to put an app together. And you can actually build an app, a lot of it, you don't even have to really do that much uh, coding. Some of the, a lot of the parameters and things you can actually just set as properties. Uh, and then I'll show how there's other pieces where it's kind of auto-filled in and stuff. So you don't have to, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of what's happening and where you need to do things. Uh, but the basic UI elements that are standard here is you have your underlying frame. Under that, typically you would have, you don't have to have forms, but most applications you would actually use the form as kind of a next level container. And of course, within that, you would put your typical controls. And here are some examples where we're calling out some of the things that are uh, really standard, again, in kind of a mobile environment. Uh, so like the indicator bar can be essentially put in place for you. It's not something that you have to actually build yourself. Um, and some things like some of the navigation elements that show up on the footer and stuff that, that uh, are actually just pretty much put in place for you. So with those forms, of course, the next question is how do I actually do my navigation from form to form? And again, they've actually built a class that supports the, the basic paradigm within Python uh, with this flow of basically moving back and, and forward between the so calling scenes. And we'll actually, what we're going to do in the sample application is just throw up something and show how easy it is to, to build uh, something with a couple of different scenes in it. And that's actually going to be using this native UI builder. And so this is actually a really nice. How many people, when you hear the WYSIWYG development tool thing, I'm going to like, you know, lay out a couple of things and then have to go code everything by hand? That's, that's often what I think when I see this stuff. But this is actually really cool, so I'll have a chance to, to walk through this piece. Um, so essentially, you're, you're going to do you know, visual design of your, of your stuff, and it's going to generate, like I said, one of these XML layout files. Uh, and all of the wiring is going to basically be put in place for you. And actually, they've kind of gone beyond just the, the whistling layout of your forms to this workflow designer. So this is a really cool piece uh, that I haven't really seen. I mean, I've seen it in some other environments, but, but not in something like this, where you can actually just visually lay out the flow of your application and set it up. And so I'm going to show how. Um, and again, this is something we'll watch through the demo, but this is to, to help you get kind of oriented. Uh, first thing is this is kind of a panel where you where you can create uh, one way that you can create new scenes in here or new forms. Um, another panel where you can set these properties. Remember, I mentioned that a lot of the stuff you can actually do handle simply by setting properties on things. I don't have to deal with code. I'll show you some animation stuff that's really neat. You don't have to worry about coding it. It's all just right there for you. Um, so then once you set up a couple of those things, you're going to go over here. These are the, where you're going to select your tools to actually do the linking up. Um, and then the final bit is actually where you're literally just uh, you know, dragging between these elements to, to indicate the flow of your application. And then the last tip that I'll call out here is uh, adding event handler. So it's like, of course, the wiring is all great, but you know you need to actually get in there and do a little bit of code to, to uh, handle some of this. And again, this is something where it's basically a lot of it is, is going to be done really simply for you. So uh, the nice thing is that you can go in, select in the properties for an event handler, and it's as soon as you choose this and give an action ID, 
it's going to actually just going to drop the, the, the boilerplate code in for you. And all the wiring stuff, is, you'll see how easily it, it's handled. So that was really quick. And again, just to kind of orient, I'm going to, this is kind of following along with, with the steps that will take in showing the application as I build it. Uh, so the first thing is, you know, just creating a new project, and we're going to be creating a native project. And in this particular case, we want to use the scene manager, so we're going to be selecting the, the scene manager template. Uh, this is talking about the manifest file. Uh, so again, similar to, to a lot of standard models these days, where you have some, a file that's uh, XML declaration and a lot of properties for your application. Uh, the one key thing about this is that some of the APIs are protected, and so you may not be able to use them unless you explicitly declare the fact that, that you're using them. Uh, so I just wanted to call that out, that that needs to be done in the XML, uh, in the manifest file. And then we build the project, and away we go. So, uh, having said that, I'm going to switch out of my demo here, so um, actually I don't want to go to the device yet. We'll go to that in a, in a minute. Uh, so you can see I've got all my stuff set up here. Uh, so one of the first things I'm going to call out actually is, and this is something that you'll want to set up for just right away. Uh, and I'm of course looking at the Mac version, and yes it's okay that I use a Mac. Um, I said it's okay, I didn't think you had to agree with it. <laughs> uh, so, you want to set up a uh, profile, and in particular, you're going to want to generate a signing certificate to be able to sign your application. So this is basically going to is require, I think for the, the earlier versions of the SDK, if anyone was playing with some of the earlier ones, you didn't actually have to have a signing certificate. At this point, it's not going to build for you unless you have one. Uh, so this is fairly straightforward. Um, it gives you instructions on what you need to do. The key thing here is that you actually need to go in the command line and uh, run the certificate generator script. So that's uh, I don't know if you're used to, to building certificates or not, but there's just a bunch of sort of standard information and you can kind of decide what you want to put in here. Uh, and so I, I won't run through all of that. Um, one thing, though, is that you can see here, one tiny trick is that you actually want to, it's, it's going to seem like it's offering to name it with a dot. P12 extension on it, and it actually doesn't do that automatically, so you want to make sure you can add that to your file name, because otherwise when you go back and look for it, you won't like, get at it. Uh, and then you just want to remember where you generated this. And then you can go back into profiles, and as you can see here, that I've got the certificate path, and then of course the certificate, since this is critical to identifying the application as yours, uh, of course, it's going to be password protected. Uh, so, when you you know choose your password wisely and remember it. Uh, okay, so that's one of the key things to remember in getting started that, that may be slightly confusing if you don't set it up right away. Uh, okay, so having had that set up. Let's go ahead and dive in to create the, the application here. So, uh, actually I actually don't want to switch yet, I'm just turning it on. <laughs> I'll have it ready in a second here. Okay, so, uh, I've actually got, one thing to notice is I've actually got Eclipse open in the native development uh, view. So you can see here I can switch to the web view and it would correspondingly change what's available over here in my uh, wizard. So 
So I'm in the web, uh, in the native view, it gives me, you know, the top thing is a Times Media project, so I can just go and select that. Uh, here, very straightforward. Um, empty amplification is something where if you're doing gaming or something and, and you don't want to worry about the UI controls and all this stuff and you just want to use the uh, frame directly, you might start with an empty project. But most of the other stuff, when you have the UI navigation, you're going to want to start with uh, a form based application. And again, here, you've got the two possibilities of using the uh, scene manager or without the scene manager. Uh, so, like I said, for make this dead simple, we'll set up one using the scene manager. And I can have type when I don't know, you ever have a problem where somebody's looking over your shoulder and suddenly you can't type no. Okay, so bang. That was really exciting, right? And what happened? That happened. But what's cool is that happened is actually a lot of stuff. So in the source, we have a whole bunch of boilerplate code. I'm not going to walk through it all. Um, and actually, when we get to debugging, which hopefully we'll have time for, uh, I'm not quite sure why the clock is showing me 87 minutes. Because I don't think I have 87 minutes. But um, uh, we'll see kind of some of the layout of this. But I mean, what's nice about this is you've got, you've got the whole boilerplate stuff here so here you can go in and explore. I mean I can just compile this right now and run it and I've got my whole world out. Uh, I want to do a little bit more than that. So we'll go a bit past that. So this is where it gets snazzy. Go in here and screen is so extended. Uh, so now, I can just right click, I can go in and pop up the uh, UI builder. So you can see, it's already made, it's already filled in a, a bunch of stuff, so this is giving me a view of the one form that I have that was auto-built for me just by creating the project. Um, see if I can shrink it down a bit so you can actually see the full thing. So you can see we've got a bunch of the standard, the, the header bit, uh, kind of flow ties in, it's already populated with, with this nice little button here. But then what's interesting is over on the right, right, uh, we have this workflow, this interesting thing, it's like, what's, you know, what's the workflow bit? So I go over and click on that, and now, this pops up the new tab that's actually showing this visual uh, workflow piece. And so you can see I have already the flow from application start to that first form. And now I can start adding new stuff. So here there's a couple of ways I can do this. Uh, some people would argue that you should only allow you to do one way, but okay. Uh, so I'm just uh, basically right clicking on here and I'm going to go ahead and ask to get a new form. And we'll see how easy it is to set up our second one here. So I'm just going to give you a name, clicking a screen resolution. You see it automatically puts in this path here that uh, you'll see is under the resource folder that you'll see in the, the project explorer. And that's it, bang. Go from that, and then of course I can mess with class name if I want, and it's going to auto populate all the stuff that I need for my class. And having done that, uh, you'll see that it shows up over on the side here. So now I'm going to select that, and you'll see when I select it, I get some properties down here that show up. And I'm just going to drag it over and, and plop it in here. And uh, now I have my second form more or less ready to go. So then, to connect this up, I just hop over here, 
pick the uh, connection option, and then I can go to something that's got basically the callback from uh, the button here. I can just drag a connection over from one to the other and wow, that's the best I got. Uh, and poof, it's gone and auto-populated. So we saw the on action perform, so your action callback. And it went ahead and filled in this this navigation sheets right here to go. Uh, you can see that it actually already pre-populated something here for, for dealing with the button click where we're just going to say, you know, hey, you click me. But now it's added in for us automatically this, this uh, navigation piece. And similarly, I can go back in. Select the right thing. Oh, I need to add a button for this. Um, I think I'm actually. Oh, no, I can do that time. So, okay. Um, So actually, as long as we've got some time, let's go back and add a button. So you can see that it was really easy. I just wanted to fill out this thing. So I, I double click on it, and it goes ahead and brings up uh, another tab that's for the second form. I kind of wish it wouldn't magnify quite so much. Let's drop that down and go ahead, and you can see uh, now we're on the left here. We have all these, these UI elements that are uh, pretty done and easy to use set up for you. I'm just going to go into common controls, grab a button, drag it over, drop it here. And here's an example where you see the button selected and I have all these button properties off on the side. And so to fill in the button text, instead of actually having to do any coding, all I have to do is come over here in the properties. And I'm going to have this actually navigate back in. When done with it, so I'm just going to say, how to say I'm done. So there I have my button, but now of course I need to actually have the button action do something, so I'm going to right click on that, and up comes the menu, and there's the add event handler. And here the main one for the navigation that you might want to use is this uh, action event listener. So um, when we go back to the code, I'll show you how we have the action event listener on the, on the other form as well. And then you just pick some action ID for this, and you're done. And it's going to pop you straight back to show you what was happening. And uh, basically what was happening is, oh, sorry. Uh, let's set some other properties in here. So my workflow, now that I have that button there and it's got the uh, action form, I can actually go ahead and drag this. So let's just say I simply want to go from one form to another form and then back. So you can see once I do that, usually make that connection, it goes back and saw before that, that, that this boilerplate uh, callback was empty and now it's going to just put in the, the actual navigation sheets. But you'll notice here, I've actually got, a, again, a call to go forward. But what I really wanted was to navigate back so that I can go back and forth between the tabs. So that's actually easy. And so here what I'm going to do, as I said a lot, again, just emphasizing over and over again, how easy it is to, to do this stuff and, and do it just setting properties. So I go back and select on my, my uh, you know, navigation indicator, and then that brings up a set of properties over here. And one of those properties being uh, the animation. So let's play and see what the depth thing looks like. 
And you'll see we actually have here is, is the, the navigation direction. Uh, this one is listed as forward, uh, which is what I want to go from my main scene to my second one. I'll go forward. Then I'll go pick on this other one and set up the navigation here as well. Do depth out so it kind of matches. In this case, I wanted to actually do a background navigation. So with those simple steps, I've actually set up everything I need for this app framework that's been something, uh, you know, you could start with this and, and expand from there. Uh, so I'm going and hit the wrong key. Uh, save everything up. Go back to the... Builder. So now I've got... Actually, again, just to highlight, so that uh, on action performed, which is that kind of uh, corresponded to, to what I was showing you in, in the, the wizard, uh, has been populated. And now I see that it's gone to this go backward uh, call. So, you know, of course, that has to do with, with your application and what it's kind of keeping on this, this uh, scene stack. And you notice actually that like none of the navigation stuff is in here. I don't even have to be bothered by looking at the navigation code. It's like it's just handled for me automatically. So with all of that stuff in place, we can go ahead and uh, build a project. You get your log down here. Uh, I really encourage people to like look at what's happening down here and understand. Well, there's there's like, a bunch of reasons for it. It can help you understand, you know, what the tools are that are being used. If you want to go do everything by hand, you can do everything by hand. Uh, the other thing, is one thing that surprised me is that my Mac didn't come with Make install, and uh, the first time, or this one anyway, when I tried to build something, and it's like nothing happened, and I wasn't sure why. And it turns out that I had to go install some extra tools. Um, and then you'll see once it's so it's actually completed with no problems in this case, and you'll see that this uh, binaries folder is shown up now. And you can go poke around and see that there's the Hello World uh, executable in there. So now that I've got that built, I can go ahead and fire it off. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and run it as a Tizen native application. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and run it uh, with the debugging because I'm going to show one quick thing with that. Uh, so actually, if we could bring up the hash tree thing. So we'll see in a second here that it's doing all the stuff to, uh, to compile it, and then it'll actually, to finish, it'll go ahead and, and push the device. So again, all that stuff is in your console log, so if you ever like want to do stuff in the command line, like there's the actual uh, I want to go to the debug perspective. Not fast um, so we see here. Uh, I don't know if you saw the transition, but there's a Hello World app that showed up. And then actually, before I kind of continue with that, if we can switch back to the regular screen. Uh, when I went to ran it in debug mode, it actually stopped at your main entry point. So your main entry point is this OSP main. And um, this is a bunch of boilerplate. You can see where it's setting up like argument lists and stuff. Uh, and then your really your, your key piece here is where it's firing off uh, your real application with this uh, create instance <laughs> method. Um, so just to give you an idea of the, the, the flow through your application in case you really want to get into the, the details of it. Uh, okay, so you can switch back to your device. And, uh, okay, so it, it halted for um, start debugging. So I just told it to continue. I didn't set any breakpoints or anything. And there I got my Hello Tyson and I got my button. 
And then sure enough, if I hit my button, it goes back, goes off to the next scene. I've got my I'm done there, hit that, and now it gets me back to uh, the original scene. So I really like that. that you know, it's just very straightforward to, to set all of this stuff up. And uh, I always tell people, at least me with my kind of background on things, you know, I like to get some framework set up that I can at least understand and start playing with something that's working. So that, you know, once you have something running, right, it's always a hundred times easier from that point to actually start adding new stuff and making it really cool. Um, So that was the simple Hello World thing. Uh, and actually now if we can switch back to the builder where I'm going to show you. Another nice thing that comes along with this is the huge array of sample code that we have. So I haven't really gotten into the APIs. Uh, frankly, there's some really interesting and unusual ones in here. Uh, so I'm going to highlight one of them here. So there's a lot of, of standard stuff that you'd expect in here. And you can see this, this big list of, of sample applications that cover all sorts of aspects of things. So you know we can go play with UI controls and stuff like that. But actually, one of the really neat ones that I want to show you is this face recognizer app. <coughs> so I'm going to go ahead and start a new application using that. Of course, it's popped up over here in the project area. And, um, so, this is actually pretty amazing. When you look at how little there is in terms of the, of the uh, code here, and again, a lot of this is basically sort of boilerplate. Um, the one thing I'm going to do is go and look for the camera, because if I run this the way it is, so there, Control H, standard clips thing, it pops up. Uh, I search for <coughs> camera piece. You know, it's all, it seems easy when you sit down and write this stuff up and then you try and make it visible on a big screen. The idea is basically you've got a front and back camera. Uh, so I'll see if I can just demo this with the back camera. So we'll go ahead and build it. And again, I'm in here. Familiar with, with you know, GCC tools and stuff, you'll see. Uh, kind of a lot of the stuff you'd expect showing up here in terms of the commands that it's running. Okay, so that built fine. And now if I can switch it over and run this.
So, Back here, uh, other things. The face tracker is only actually on the show, and that's why I wasn't playing the camera. Where I was Search and find this constructor for a uh, camera. I'm going to change this to the front facing camera. Of course, you have uh, the kind of auto complete stuff that you're used to in your clips. So it's like that. Uh, So really, I mean, you know, this this will be fun to look at. But the main thing that I'm getting at is, of course, the, the, the amount of support that you have in uh, building for Tizen with uh, all of this built-in stuff. Uh, you know, I haven't had a chance to go through anywhere near that whole list of, of example applications that you have. So let's run this guy. I want to show this just because, uh, you know, we really done more than build just a sort of standard platform here, but there's a lot of capabilities that uh, go kind of above and beyond what you might expect in uh, other applications. Okay, can we switch over? Okay, so there we go, the face tracker. Um, so right now it's staring back up at Elmo. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't think that Elmo has a face. Uh, let's see if I can get uh, Besides that, I have a face. Where is it? Uh, where is it? This is going to look good for you. Yeah. So look at that. Is that yeah. cool or what? Cool. Uh, and it's open platform, I think this is one of the cool 
thing is, is in some ways Python is going to be what people make it, right? So, and, you know, the QT stuff that was there for Vigo and, uh, you know, all that whole background is, is uh, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody, you know, just up and does it, so. Uh, any other questions? A long way back there. Way over there. Uh, compiling the different architectures, so uh, the question was how to handle compiling for different architectures, so um, you have your build configurations. Uh, and I think this one's actually just set up for the x86 uh, binary, so I can't kind of walk through the whole thing, but, but uh, you would, You'll have support in the toolkit for, for uh, basically you know, the two primary things. Obviously, you tell the huge backer, and so uh, you know, having tool sets that, that support Intel processors is going to be critical. Um, but also, you know, ARM uh, is so popular, it's going to be in there. Okay. Uh, and of course, we'll be around for the, the rest of the dev lab. So, uh, you know, come and grab. We've got actually several people that are going to be here, I think, supporting for a while. So I'd love to talk to you more about what we've got here. Um, then I'm going to pass it over for the web part. Windows support for XP and 7 and 64-bit and 32-bit also. 
And one of the things that enables that to have happened is the uh, acceleration of the emulator. And so I just wanted to make a note, you know, when you install on Windows or Mac, ensure that you have the Hardware Acceleration Execution Manager installed. It should install. Sometimes on the Mac it doesn't. So just check that you have that. It will make your experience with the emulator uh, 10 times better, at least. It, it won't, um, when you're using the emulator, it won't cause you extreme stress like you used to when you were waiting. waiting. Um, okay. I am going to talk uh, quickly about some of the things that, that weren't covered as much in some of the other sessions. You know, we put the dev lab at the end of the conference, so we've heard some fairly deep dive technical discussions and different topics, and this is an overview. And I'll, I'll go over quickly things that have been said and point out a few things I've found. Um, you know, when you start to prepare the presentation, you find a whole bunch of little issues, and I'll try to highlight the things that I discovered as I was putting together my presentation that will help you get over a few hurdles when you're creating your, your web application. Um, we'll also walk through really quickly, similar to what Bob did for native, creating the, uh, a web application, deploying it, I'll deploy it to the emulator on my system, uh, quickly showing you how to set up the debug environment and how to package it and get it ready for deployment to the store and make it so that you'll know everything that you need to so that you can win the first prize in our contest and, and retire. <laughs> so, um, and then, you know, depending on the time, I'll, I'll introduce the, the Tizen device APIs, the APIs that allow you to get the, the sensors and hardware uh, information on the system. Uh, I'll, I'll go over that quickly. That's a little bit dry, so I was putting it at the end, and hopefully we run out of time before we get there. But uh, if not, we'll, we'll go through that quickly. So we've been waving our hands in an excited fashion, talking about how awesome the web framework is for Tizen. We we are excited about it. We think that it's world class, and as it mentioned in in a, a few of the keynotes, uh, the benchmarks for compatibility are very high. We want to make sure that. We are, um, we've been very involved with the standards group, uh, working with W3C, looking at the progress of HTML5, uh, embracing it, trying to enhance it and extend it, and, and find a good balance between getting the, the cutting edge API and, and features with stability. Uh, and, and that's another reason when we talk about the ties and device APIs as a complement to the things that may that we feel are maybe not quite ready in HTML5 yet. Um, performance has been a big uh, focus, both in the SDK and on the device. Uh, responsiveness, acceleration, making things feel really uh, smooth. Uh, the the framework, web framework also includes a rich set of web UI uh, widgets based on jQuery mobile. So everything you need to list and buttons and drop downs and, and things so that uh, if you follow those, if you use those widgets, we can have a nice, consistent look and feel across applications that aren't designed that way. It's not just a, a fully graphics game or something like that. Um, the, the main components of WebView, based on uh, WebKit and EFL, JavaScript core, the Web core backend implementation of HTML5 APIs, and then the WebKit API. The web runtime is based on WebKit, uh, built with EFL, the, the Enlightenment Foundation Libraries, and supports the standard W3C package. Uh, it also supports the applications that are hosted on a server, so you would install your WGT uh, package locally, but the, the information would point to the server so your, your application can be hosted. Uh, the standard um, package management features to install, uninstall, and update. And then we have these two primary categories of APIs, the HTML5 uh, W3C API, which is what you would have outside of Tizen. And any, if you're porting the application, it would be based on that. And then an enhancement to that to enable the applications to get information from the system that we call the device API. Um, we won't go through everything blind here, but this is, if you 
go online and also in the uh, offline help, you can get all of the details about which specific APIs and features are supported in HTML5. And there's links to the, the definitions of these things in the outside of Python, so you can get all the information uh, about exactly what is supported. Um, the features, and again, we're, we're continually looking at uh, bringing in the best and, and especially the mature and uh, features from the HTML5 uh, progress and participating there and contributing to things that we enhance back upstream. So hot the uh, introduction of the IDE, I won't go into great detail there, we'll use it in a second and, and I'm sure you're familiar with, with it and, and when you use it you become familiar quickly. Um, I'd like to walk through these, these steps quickly, create an application and talk about the features there and look at the components of your application when it's built, how to package it and a, a couple of hurdles to get over. Uh, and I'll come back and make sure I've covered this. So I'll just switch over to my uh, Eclipse environment. So when you come to your project, I've got them navigating from the screen to find my cursor. Okay. So in addition to all of the great native samples, there's a lot of good material in the web samples, and I hope you'll look through them. They have a number of different templates that you can use to get started. If you're bringing your application over uh, from another environment, you can just start with the basic, and that will, that will fill out the, the elements that you need for, for the minimal application. And then you can just replace everything else with your application, call into your main HTML file and your application should work. Uh, and, and you can also, there's um, some information on the website that talks about how to load your web application inside the IDE. Uh, there's uh, just two main files that you need. So it's Eclipse based, so bringing your application from another tool, you'll need to create a dot project file and you'll want the Tizen config.xml file for all the permissions and access and features that you'll need for a Tizen application. So those are described on the website. If you look for loading your web application, it has a couple of those uh, template files you can just put into your project. It makes it very easy. Then you can have your project loaded in the Eclipse IDE. Um, there is a whole bunch of web app samples that can give you a head start. Uh, if you're doing something kind of like one of the samples, you can look at how they did it. Uh, the Compass uh, had listens for GPS information, and so things like that. I, I recommend looking through the samples and seeing if you can get a head start there if you're starting from scratch. And then one thing that I have found nice and I'd like to recommend is the user templates, especially if you're um, working with a group that's creating multiple apps that work together, which is often the case if you're a company and you have three or four different applications you're targeting, you want them to have similar features, you can create uh, user templates and um, then everybody can, can start out with, you know, the, the types of things that, that, that you want everybody to have the same as, so you can start with the, with, uh, the same UI elements and navigation and everything. Um, for your company, for your project, or even for yourself. So I, I created my own template and that's what I always start with and it helps me solve all the little things that I always do every single time. Um, okay, so here I've created a, a, a basic project and you can see what the, the contents of the project are and just to show um, on the file system, so my workspace is workspace-tdc, and here I've got a project called TDC Bob, and so it, it's, there's not a lot of magic that goes on there. What you see in that file list is, is this same directory. What you'll find here is there's also this 
project file um, that allows Eclipse to know which builders to use to build your web app. It, it, it can be a little bit frustrating when you bring your web application from somewhere else in and it's not building your package and you don't, it doesn't give you a lot of information about why. But the reason is because you haven't associated the correct web app builders with your project. So it's building nothing and saying all is well. So you want to make sure that you've got a, a, a .project file configured with this information that talks about the different builders to actually create a, a, a Tizen web application package. Um, things are familiar here. So we've got a, our, our primary file, it can be any name, and the primary icon for your application. And then I wanted to look inside the config XML. So by default, it was open already, but it opens in this graphical interface, and at the bottom you have the features that are important for the for for Kaizen. Just I'll just mention a couple. You can read about them. I think I might even have that also open here. No, they're also online. It talks about each of the things. I recommend that you you understand what each of those tabs means. Um, to Things that are interesting features are uh, things that your application requires from the device that you're targeting. So if you are a compass, you might require that a GPS be present. So you need to put into the features that it, it must have support for that sensor, that for GPS. And this is used when your application is in the store to filter which devices would be able to see your application so that we don't send a compass application to a device without a GPS and it just doesn't work and then there's a bad experience. The next one that is important to understand is the privileges. So in the device APIs, getting access to hardware on the system requires specific privileges and you want the user to be able to uh, grant those privileges when they install that application. If you don't put the privilege in your application when you're trying to do the, use those APIs, they'll be failing. So you need to make sure that you, you put the privilege that, of the things you want, and then when that application, your application gets downloaded, the, the consumer will get the option to say, can this application access these features? Okay. Um, the, the final output is, so all of those things are, are in text, in source, so you can also just edit the text once you're an expert on it. all the things there, if that's what you prefer. So when you, when you create a project, if by chance it crashes, it never happens when you're practicing, but if, just to be glad it doesn't happen in front of a lot of people, you just start it back up. Um, and then move it over. So, try it again. When I built this project, one of the things I found was um, it's common when I make a project, you may have multiple words to use a hyphen. And hyphen's fine for the project name, but there's an ID that gets generated automatically, and if it has a non alphanumeric character, then you get this error. And when you go to uh, find out what the error is. You'll open the project, you'll see there's a little red flag next to config.xml, and you'll discover by hovering over the error that the value is not facet valid with respect to pattern something something, which means you have a hyphen. So <laughs> you just need to remove the hyphen. And Save your config XML, and then you should be. You won't make that error. So, just a tip. Okay. Um, let me make sure I covered the components: features, privileges, non-alphanumeric characters. Oh, certificate generation. I touched on that. So the same thing for. Um, for web apps that is the native applications, they need to be signed. And it's just a one step. When you use the SDK, you only have to do this once. 
and that is to generate a certificate. He showed how to get to it. If you don't have a certificate, it tells you, and it has a link to where you set it up, and it has help, and I found it to be very easy. So uh, if you run into that, it, it shouldn't be a big deal, and you only have to do that once. Um, okay, when, if, you, if you're successful, you'll get a package, and that, in this very basic application, is now ready to deploy. Assuming we debug it and it's got all, all the right magic in it, it's ready to go to the store. It should be signed with our certificate and, uh, and, and ready to be sent off. So when we're talking about the, the contest, we're expected to be receiving uh, a packaged signed application just like that. Okay, 